so thank you, John. And thanks also to Cody for putting together this series and for having me here today. So uh, today I will talk about the Higgs bundle vacua in string theory. And uh, this is based on a paper that we published this month together with Miriam, Jonathan, Thomas, and Ethan, who are all at N. And uh, as you can see from the title, my talk will be only part of what we did in the paper. The rest of it will be covered by Thomas next week. So I encourage you to tune in to hear the rest of the story next week. So let me start by giving some introduction. And um, so, uh, well, it's needless to say that there is a rich interplay between string theory and geometry. And uh, um, as, uh, a very important role in this is played by special holonomy manifolds. We all know and like the case of Calabrian trifolds that can be used for type one heterotic or type two compactifications. We can use Calabrian fourfolds for F theory and uh, G2 manifolds for uh, M theory. So if you look at the classification of a special holonomy manifolds, there is one outlier, which is spin seven manifolds. Uh, if you consider M theory on a spin seven manifold, this gives 3D and equals to one supersymmetry which is basically half of what you get, uh, half of the supersymmetry that is uh, usually happens in 4D backward. So it's only two supercharges. And uh, there were attempts of uh, having an F theory uh, kind of limit for this kind of aqua. And uh, um, um, it's also interesting that um, it's possible to build uh, some interesting solution that we did uh, in a couple of papers, but I'm not going to cover this. And uh, the main difficulty with spin seven and uh, also G2 manifolds is that building compact example is, uh, an is a very difficult task. So uh, recently, starting from the, with the construction by Kovalev, there's been uh, new methods for building G2 manifolds. This is usually called the twisted connector sum. And uh, they use some building blocks and glue them to build G2 manifolds. And recently, there's been a similar construction also from spin seven manifold by Andreas Brown and Sakura Sharp and Nameki. But it's still a very difficult thing. The volume of example is much less than compared with the Calabiao case. And uh, one of the great advantages of type two strings, uh, and also their strong coupled limits, is that they contain uh, uh, localized gauge sectors. So one general strategy that's been followed in the literature is to study localized sectors to see if they have some uh, viable phenomenological features and then uh, address the question of compactification afterwards. Of course, there are problems that can arise when you compactify. Not everything you may want to do in a localized model can carry on to a full compact model, but still it's a good starting point to uh, to build a phenomenological models. So in this uh, talk, I will talk about the localized sectors that you find from M theory and spin seven manifolds. Uh, this is interesting also from a mathematical point of view. And uh, one uh, consequence that we will see from this uh, kind of system is that it provides a unification of other non-local systems or sometimes known also as Higgs bundles. Uh, moreover, we see that the, this can be used to build interfaces between uh, for the vacua that can have inter, um, um, <coughs> and this can be used beyond the context of a high energy theory, like in condensed matter theory. So, in the following, I will present some different systems that we will consider different Higgs bundles. So, let me give you some unifying pictures, some background. And uh, when you talk about local systems, uh, this usually basically control the gauge interaction localized on brains as dictated by supersymmetry. And uh, <clears throat> if you want to get the Lagrangian and Suzy transformation, the easiest way to start from 10D superior means, which is like the, the mother of all these kind of systems. And then you perform a truncation on a certain number of directions. What do I mean by truncation? Basically you take 
and you throw away all derivatives on the directions where you want to truncate, and then you treat the legs of the gauge field in those directions as a scalar fields. So after you truncate the gauge, you, you will have a bosonic sector that consists of a gauge field and a joint scalars that are basically the motion in the transverse directions and fermions as dictated by supersymmetry. Uh, it's very convenient to follow this procedure because you can get the supersymmetry transformation from uh, especially the one of the gauge genome by simple uh, by performing this procedure. Uh, once you get these systems, they are basically lower dimensional version of maximally supersymmetric super young meals. You can put the system on curved manifolds and you want to look for what are SUSE configurations. So let me give the example that we are looking, going to look at because it's not very familiar and I can explain the various steps that are done in the process. So the starting point is seven dimensional super young meals. So how do you obtain it? You start from 10 dimensional super young meals in the truncating three directions. So the bosonic sectors consist of gauge fields and three adjoint scalars. Uh, there are global symmetries of the system. Uh, one is basically the, simply the Lorentz group in seven dimensions. And then you have a R symmetry, which is in nothing but the rotation group in the transverse direction where you perform the truncation. Uh, this controls the gauge interaction on a stack of D6 brains. Another way to obtain it is to take N theory and you put it on an AD singularity. So what we want to do with this system is to take it on a curved four manifold. <laughs> so we'll take a generic four manifold, M, and uh, <laughs> you can take, uh, so the Lorentz group is no longer the one in seven dimension. You only have the one in three dimension, and then you have the holonomy group for the manifold, which is generically SO4 basically, which splits an SU2, SU2, and then you have the uh, R symmetry, which remains unchanged. To preserve some supersymmetry, you need to perform what is called the topological twist, uh, which basically consists of embedding uh, the R symmetry group, which is SU2, inside one of the two SU2s. Uh, after you do this, the scalars will no longer be scalars, but they will transform as self-dual two forms that take value in the adjoint representation of the gauge group. Uh, the system, preserves 3 dn equals one supersymmetry. Uh, what happens to the internal geometry after you do this is that you get uh, M theory on a local spin seven manifold. This is basically a, a vibration on an AD singularity of the four manifold M that we considered. Uh, its weak coupling limit is basically type 2A on a G2 manifold with this experience. Okay. So, <laughs> An important piece is to uh, consider the BPS equations. So we want to put the non-trivial configuration for the gauge bosons and the Higgs fields in the on the four manifold. And uh, the system of equations that you get uh, is the one that I wrote. So one equation basically says that this the Higgs field has to be covariantly constant. And uh, the other piece, fixes the, what is the self-dual part of the gauge fields in terms of a product of phi in itself. Uh, this is a system of equation that's very similar to the one that was obtained by Buffer and Witten in 94. Though in those equations, there's also an additional field that is not present here. And <laughs> this cross product that we defined, it can be seen in two ways. Either you can think of it as inherited, from the tree form on the, uh, the space of, sub, of the bundle of sub dual two forms of M. Uh, another equivalent definition is that you can use the metric on M and define this product in this way. It basically maps a, a pair of sub dual two forms to another sub dual two form. And uh, as you can see, you need to take the commutator in the, in the algebra. And, uh, the supersymmetry condition can be obtained from a 3D superpotential. 
And this can be uh, the 3D superpotential. Uh, let me mention only it's uh, that in 3D for n equals to one supersymmetry, the superpotential is uh, not a complex function. There's no notion of holomorphicity. Everything is just any real function that you want. Okay. So uh, I mentioned that this uh, system, this is, these are the details for this system. And uh, in the following, I will present other similar systems that can be obtained. Uh, but uh, I will give a much uh, more brief introduction to these systems uh, uh, for lack of time, basically. So uh, also because these are much more familiar. So the first case that we consider is a 5D n equals to 1 vacua. Uh, you can start from 7D super young mills. Again, you can get it from M theory and AD singularity or a stack of the six brains. And you want to compactify this uh, on a complex curve. So after twisting, the Higgs field become a joint valued one forms. There's a comma zero form and a zero comma one form because you have a complex manifold. You can decompose them in that way. And the BPS equations basically say that they are, it is a holomorphic section of a gauge of the bundle. And uh, the flux, uh, the curvature of the uh, bundle is actually fixed in terms of the commutator of phi with itself. When I write the commutator, I'm implicitly assuming also that there is a white product uh, inside. I'm not going to write it also in other cases. Uh, so this system of equation is very famous. This is called the Hitching system. Uh, Hitching got it in 87 by considering uh, instanton equations or a four manifold and doing a truncation in two directions. So he did something similar that we did somehow. Uh, another way to get it, but in six dimensions, is by using seven brains. So in that case, you would start from a D superior young mills talk about uh, type 2b or uh, f theory. But uh, we will not use that in the problem. <laughs> uh, this, the next case is for d n equals to 1 back one. So there's two main branches that we want to discuss. The first one is pretty famous. It can be obtained from uh, starting from AD superior means. You have either f theory and ID singularity or stack of the seven brains, and we want to compactify it on a complex surface. So you can perform a topological twist that gives uh, a complex uh, adjoint 2,0 form. So the Higgs field becomes a 2,0 form, which uh, is fixed to be holomorphic by the BPS equations. The bundle itself has to be a holomorphic bundle, so the 0,2 part of the curvature has to be zero. And there is the <coughs> non-primitive part of the, um, uh, the curvature of the bundle is fixed in terms of the commutator of phi with itself. The J there is simply the Kähler form of the manifold. So this system, we will call it in the following DHV system from the name of the authors. And this has been extensively used for s theory model building in the, uh, in the past. Um, it's a very nice system because you are talking about complex geometry inside. So it has a holomorphic structure that makes it particularly easy to build a solution even when you have non-abelian one. What I mean non-abelian is that when this commutator does not vanish. Uh, <clears throat> so the next case is maybe less familiar. This was done by Panther and Feinholt. And uh, this is uh, uh, like the mirror dual version. It's like 70 superior mills. You have a theory on ID singularity of the six brains. And uh, you put the system on a tree manifold. After the twisting, the Higgs field becomes a one form that is fixed to be uh, covariantly harmonic in this case. And uh, <coughs> the, uh, again, the curvature of the bundle is fixed in terms of the commutator of five itself. So we will call this Panther Weinholt or PW system in the following. In this case, it's more difficult to build non abelian solutions. Uh, last year, we published a paper and then we considered some non abelian solution and uh, the repercussion for the presence of localized modes, but I will not discuss further this. So 
I presented so far four different systems, four different Higgs bundle systems across different dimensions. So we start with Hitchin, we have BHV, Pender one hook and the spin sound system. So are there connections between them? And uh, the answer is yes. For instance, if you have a solution on the Hitchin system, you can embed it in a solution of BHV. And um, similarly, you can also embed Hitchin in the Panther one hole system. So these are better known uh, examples. What we showed is that actually spin seven can include both solution of BHV and solution of Panther one hole. So in the following, I will give details about these last two connections and show how you can embed a solution of Panther one hole size B7 and a solution of BHV in size B7 and discuss the interpretation of these embeddings. So how do you do this? Uh, in the, from, from going to, from Panther one hole to spin seven, you need to take spin seven on a four manifold that uh, uh, is the product of a circle and a three manifold that I will call Q. And uh, we will write the subdual forms uh, in the following fashion. So here we specify the different uh, Higgs fields. Phi subdual is the uh, spin seven Higgs field, and phi panther W will be interpreted as a panther one hole Higgs field. And DT is uh, uh, the one form along the circle on the S1. So this is basically uh, the way we decompose the self dual two form on this kind of manifold. You can write this in seven equations that take the following form. And the terms that I highlighted in orange are the extra term with respect to Panther one hole. So when these terms are not present, you recover the Panther one hole system. And <coughs> so basically this happens is if the uh, polynomial around the circle is zero, and all fields are independent of the direction of this uh, of the circle. So basically, you can interpret that a one hole as a dimensional reduction of spin seven along this additional direction that appears in the game. And uh, <coughs> so, from the case, <coughs> the other case that we'll discuss is the BHV to spin seven. In this case, you need to take the four manifold to be a Kähler manifold. And you can use the Hodge decomposition to write the self dual two form as a 2,0 form is conjugate, which is a 0,2 form, and a non preventive form that is uh, of Hodge type 1,1. One, one. And uh, the BPS equations can be written again uh, using these answers. And you can see that, again, there are additional terms so with respect to BHP that are higher. Light highlighted in orange. And once these terms are zero, you simply recover the original system, the BHV system. So this can be done by simply taking the one, one com component of the five set dual to be zero. Uh, so we saw that actually uh, particular solutions of uh, spin seven that basically have en uh, enhanced supersymmetry in 3D are can be interpreted as a solution of BHV or Panther one hole. The question is, what is the interpretation of the spin seven equation from the point of view of BHV and Panther one hole? And the answer is that they are domain Wolf's equations. So let me review briefly. So half BPS domain Wolf's uh, can be in 4D n equals to one theorems uh, are controlled by this kind of flow equations. So here T is the direction along which the domain wall happens. And you have several ingredients. This is the set of chiral multiplet. You have the kilometric. The domain wall is specified in terms of a phase eta, which is constant. And you have a super, and the superpotential is what controls these domain walls. And um, you can use domain walls to interpolate dif di between different backgrounds. Uh, an interesting observation is that if scalars that do not uh, appear in the superpotential actually do not participate in the flow, they remain constant. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the phase eta 
is actually fixed once you know the super potential in the two asymptotic regions uh, by this equation, basically. Uh, so let me show the interpretation of spin seven as domain walls. We need to know what are the super potential for BHV and pent one hole. So in the case of pent one hole, the system is rather simple. It's a uh, <coughs> The super potential is basically a complex wide chain Simons uh, term on the three manifold. Basically, what you do is to take the gauge connection and you complexify it with the Higgs field, which is a one form, so you are allowed to do that. And the domain wall equations can be written and they take the following form. So these are complex equations. You span them in real and imaginary part, and you get the spin seven equations. When you choose the gauge field to be zero along the domain wall directions, and uh, you take uh, the phase to be zero. This has to be supplemented with another condition, which is the vanishing of the D term, which is unaltered during the domain wall. And so the BHP superpotential takes the following form. And here we encounter like one puzzle. If you think about it, BHV happens on a four manifold and so does spin seven. So when you take a domain wall of a BHV solution, you're actually going, you would think you're going on a five dimensional manifold. And the resolution is that uh, fields basically are constant along the domain wall direction and uh, you're breaking for the Lorentz, for the Lorentz group, by taking a non-trivial component of the gauge field along the domain wall direction. And if you consider the duality from M theory to type to B, this is basically interpreted as the additional component of the Higgs field. <clears throat> so I stress that this is like a system of domain wall equations. Uh, the question is, uh, what is an interpretation in the effective field theory? And uh, so, um, so the spin seven equation are basically domain wall equation. The problem is that the modes that are flowing tend to be massive, and you can think of them having a very high mass, at the Kaluza current scale or GAT scale, if you want to think about it that way. So, in an effective field theory, you will not see them. You need uh, the full seven D or eight D theory to access the, uh, this uh, this mode. So to stress this distinction between a domain wall where the uh, field is dynamical in the EFT and uh, this kind of configuration, we prefer to call these uh, interfaces. Interfaces, And uh, um, what happens in the effective field theory is for instance, that you can think of having position dependent couplings because these couplings are determined by the value of fields that are not dynamical. And since you are flowing in that direction, this coupling will presumably depend on that direction once you integrate out uh, <coughs> the massive modes. And <coughs> so this is more or less what I wanted to tell you. Let me go to the conclusions. So basically Higgs bundles uh, appear in many different string background. And there's a plethora of systems, but what we wanted to show is that the spin seven Higgs bundle kind of provides a unification of other non systems. Um, uh, when you consider uh, half VPS domain walls in 4D n equals to one theories, basically, you can show that they obey the spin seven system of equation. So basically what happens is that once you consider this configuration, the internal manifold will turn out to be a spin seven manifold. Uh, however, we argued that it's better to uh, interpret this as interfaces as opposed to domain walls. Uh, and this is the content of my talk. Let me remind you that next week, Thomas is going to give the other half of the talk. He's going to talk about the analysis and construction of solutions. Uh, and uh, several features like localized mode, et cetera. And uh, we'll present some explicit domain wall solution and interpolation that can be very interesting. And uh, this is all I wanted to tell you and thank you for your attention.
Great. Uh, thank you, Jean Luca. Let's clap using Zoom's <laughs> clap feature. Um, are there any questions for Jean Luca? Hi, uh, can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah, so thanks, Luca. That was, that was nice. Um, Thank you. Is there, is there any, like, how, so you make the distinction between domain walls and interfaces, and mm -hmm. how do you, I mean, the, uh, what is the distinction at the fundamental level? Like, you can still transfer matter and energy through them, right? Uh, so. uh, there's no fundamental distinction. Description. It, the thing is that in effective field theory, you uh -huh. see basically couplings that are flowing rather than dynamical fields. That's the it, 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 they're like like uh, so. There are extra modes that become light at the interface that wouldn't become light at the domain wall. Uh, or it, uh, enough couplings that I wouldn't see in any effective field theory. Yeah, there is the possibility of having local uh, light localized modes, but. Uh, yeah, for sure. But uh, still, the, mo the modes that are flowing during the domain world will be massive and therefore invisible in the effective field theory. It's like uh, when you think of the interface between a topological insulator and uh, mm -hmm. the usual vacuum. No? You, there you're yeah. flowing with a theta angle. You might have a localized fermion at the middle, but uh, that's the distinction we want to make. I see. I see. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, if not, let's thank Jean-Luc again. Thank you. Um, Let me stop sharing.